the world was flat and entirely submerged in water up until this point. As soon as God's command, let the waters be gathered together, was heard, mountains and hills formed out of nowhere, and the water began to build up in the low-lying basins. When God instructed it to occupy the lower regions, the water resisted and threatened to engulf the land. The water was then forced to flow back into the sea, and sand was spread over it by God. Whenever the water feels tempted to leave its boundaries after witnessing the sand, it currently shrinks back. The third day of the creation story from the legend of the Jews served as the inspiration for this story. Previously, the world had been flat and buried underwater. Hills and mountains started to appear all around at the instant God commanded, let the waters be gathered together, and the water started to accumulate in the low-lying basins. But until God forced the water back into the sea and bordered the sea with sand, the water defied the command to occupy the lowly places and threatened to overwhelm the ground. Now, any time the water feels tempted to cross its borders, it sees the sand and pulls back. The plant kingdom, which comprises both terrestrial and paradisiacal plants, was the main creation on the third day. The first great trees were the Lebanon cedar and others. They were so happy to be given priority that they sprang high into the air. They thought that they were the most favored of all plants. Then, on the same day that he created iron, the substance used to fell trees, God said, I hate arrogance and pride, for I alone am exalted, and none beside. The trees replied, We cry because you created the iron to uproot us with, when God asked them why they were sobbing. We had always thought of ourselves as the best on earth, but now our demise has been brought about by the creation of the iron. God answered, You shall give the axe a handle. Without your assistance, the iron won't be able to hurt you in any manner. Only trees were given the directive to bear offspring of their own species. The many varieties of grass countered that since trees are prone to classifying themselves into species, God would not have instructed them to bear fruit containing the seed of their kind. The grasses consequently reproduced in accordance with their nature. Let the Lord's splendor continue for all time, let the Lord rejoice in his works, said the Prince of the world in response. The most important task finished on the third day was the building of paradise. Two carbuncle gates that mark the entrance to paradise are watched over by sixty myriads of ministering angels. Each of these angels exudes a celestial glow. The burial robes are taken off the righteous man as he approaches the gates, and the angels clothe him in seven garments of clouds of glory and adorn his head with two crowns, one fashioned of parvain gold and the other of precious stones and pearls. Before telling him to go his way and eat his bread with delight, they praise him and place eight myrtles in his hand. Then they take him to an area with 800 distinct kinds of rose and myrtle species and numerous waterways. Each individual has a canopy over his or her head beneath which four rivers flow, a river of milk, a river of balsam, a river of wine, and a river of honey. Each canopy from which a gold vine has grown is hung with 30 pearls, each of which shines like Venus. Go and eat with joy of the honey, for thou hast been busy with the Torah, and she is sweeter than honey, and drink of the wine stored in the grape since the six days of creation, for thou hast been busy with the Torah, and she is compared to wine. These are the words that sixty angels address to each just man as they stand at his head on a table with precious gems and pearls is placed under each canopy. Rabbi Jonathan and Joseph, as well as the silver pomegranate seeds that catch the sun's rays, as well as the least beautiful of the just, are all equally beautiful. There is no light because the shining light is the light of the righteous. And each day, they undergo four changes and four states. In the first, the righteous are changed into children. He walks into the children's area and gets a taste of what it's like to be a youngster. When he enters the division for young people, he transforms into a young person and enjoys all the pleasures of youth. Then, when he is in his prime and has reached adulthood, he joins the community of men and enjoys all that masculinity has to offer. He finally becomes an old guy. He joins the senior group and enjoys becoming older. Eighty myriads of trees can be found in every corner and cranny of paradise, 
and the meanest of them is superior to any tree that produces spices. There are sixty myriads of angels singing in each corner, and the tree of life, which sits in the center and shades the entire paradise. It contains fifteen thousand various flavors, and each flavor has a unique fragrance. It is covered in seven clouds of splendor, and winds come from all four directions, causing its fragrance to travel throughout the globe. The Torah is being explained by the academics who are seated below. Each of them is covered by two canopies, one composed of stars and the other of the sun and moon, and is separated from the other by a curtain of glory clouds. Eden, which contains 310 worlds and seven parts for each of the seven categories of the devout, is located beyond paradise. The first category includes the government's martyr victims, including Rabbi Akiba and his colleagues, the second category includes those who drowned, and the third category includes Rabbi Johanan ben Zakkai and his followers. In the fourth, there are those who were taken away in the cloud of glory, in the fifth, there are the penitents, who sit in a position that not even the most pious man can attain, and in the sixth, there are young people, to whom God then explains the Torah while seated in the middle of them. The length and width of each of the seven regions of paradise is twelve myriads of miles. The first segment is home to the proselytes who choose Judaism voluntarily and without coercion. Walls are constructed of glass, and the wainscoting is made of cedar. The prophet Obadiah, who is also a proselyte, is the head of this first division. The silver wainscoting in the second division is made of cedar and is constructed. Manasseh, Hezekiah's repentant son, is in charge of the repentant inhabitants of this place. The third division is made up of silver and gold. All of the Israelites who fled Egypt, including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as the generation that dwelt in the wilderness, are buried here. All of David's sons, with the exception of Absalom, are there, including Chilib, who is still alive. With the exception of Hezekiah's son Manasseh, who is in charge of the penitent in the second division, all of Judah's kings are present. Moses and Aaron are in command of the third division, including magnificent items made of silver, gold, and jewels, canopies, beds, thrones, and lamps made of gold, precious stones, and pearls, this place has the greatest of everything that exists in heaven. The fourth division is built of lovely rubies, and its wainscoting is of olive wood. The wainscoting in this place, where the perfect and the steadfast in faith dwell, is built of olive wood because of how bitter their lives were to them. The fifth division, which contains silver, gold, refined gold, and the purest kinds of gold, is centered on the Gion River. More delicate odor permeates the silver and gold wainscoting than the odor of Lebanon. Scarlet and goat hair, which was woven by angels, and purple and blue, which was weaved by Eve, serve as the materials for the coverings of the silver and gold beds. On a palanquin made of Lebanon wood with silver pillars, a gold base, and a purple seat, the Messiah is kept in this location. He is with Elijah. He takes the head of the Messiah and cradles it in his bosom, saying, Be quiet, for the end is near. Every Monday and Thursday, as well as on Sabbaths and holidays, the twelve sons of Jacob, the patriarchs, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, and all the kings of Israel and Judah pay him a visit. They weep with him, comfort him, and counsel him to be still and put your trust in your Creator because the end is near. Korah and his company, Dathan, Abram, and Absalom visit him every Wednesday to ask him about the approaching doom. When will you revive us and extricate us from the earth's depths? They are embarrassed and decide not to ask their fathers when the Messiah instructs them to do so. The sixth section is reserved for individuals who died while performing a good deed, whereas the seventh division is reserved for those who died as a result of illnesses brought on by Israel's sins. Thank you for watching.